I'm going to talk about American manufacturing, how we solve for American manufacturing. Um, American manufacturing is not dead, despite many people thinking that. It's a $2 trillion uh, enterprise. Chinese manufacturing is $2 trillion. European manufacturing is $2 trillion. Japanese manufacturing is $1 trillion. So that just gives you a, a size of the scale of, of manufacturing. But American manufacturing has I think lost its ways in many ways. It hasn't had the information technology revolution that everything else in our lives has had. And we have over, uh, we've made it less resilient. After Fukushima in 2011, 10 days later, American manufacturers started shutting down because the supply chain went via Japan and things were not resilient. So how do we make it resilient? We um, have made American manufacturing efficient by outsourcing the low end. We started after the Second World War um, whoops, by going to Japan, where it was a technological society, economy was in ruins, low-cost labor. But as the economy came back up, it was no longer low-cost labor. So we moved. We, we headed off to Korea, low-cost labor. The society grew. People became more aware. People moved up the value chain. And it became too expensive. We moved to Taiwan. Same thing happened there. Um, Manufacturing was cheap there originally, but it became more expensive. Um, and uh, <laughs> so uh, then we moved into southern China via Hong Kong. Like the same sort of thing happened. By the early 90s, it was too expensive to do sewing for toys in, in China, by the late, late 90s. And so we started moving down to Vietnam in the late 90s. And there things go up. And eventually, we run out of places to go do low-cost manufacturing. But doing low-cost manufacturing in, 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 in the far distant uh, places has had a bad impact on our innovation because the innovation tends to move to those places. The innovation doesn't happen back here where the innovators are. So there's some movement happening out there in the world now. There's a bunch of people doing different things coming together in, in, in small groups and they're spread out across the country. Um, not just in Silicon Valley, not just in Boston. There's, there's stuff happening where there's makers, there's tech shop, there's all this sort of bottom-up stuff. How do we build stuff ourselves? How do we make that happen? And I think that's the, the core of a great idea. So there are people out there um, making stuff. Um, some of you might know uh, Chris Anderson up in the right-hand corner. He just left Wired to go to his maker space where he's building stuff for do-it-yourself drones. Um, but there's lots of people. Uh, bottom, bottom right there is uh, a MakerBot, which is a 3D printer. You see it's made out of wood um, uh, out of New York City. There's a lot of people doing this stuff. They're just bubbling away at stuff. And it reminds me a lot of something that most of you are too young to remember. But I remember Silicon Valley in around the late 70s, the Homebrew Computer Club led to us here. That led to what, what, what we all have. It led to people trying out ideas, then venture capitalists coming in, a whole infrastructure coming in on top of that, and we got to where we are today with information technology. So that's starting to happen with manufacturing and doing it yourself, building stuff yourself. But it needs a bunch of things. The, 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 the computer revolution, the IT revolution didn't just happen by itself. There were a bunch of other things that were needed. There was inventions, certainly. We need a lot of inventions. I'm going to show you some inventions. But we also need infrastructure and new business models. And new business models are an opportunity. There's lots and lots of opportunity in how we change manufacturing. I'm going to talk about inventions first. Invention is incredibly important to information technology. Invention after invention. There's lots of inventions in the manufacturing space. The one I've been working on uh, uh, is, uh, <coughs> for the last four years is about low-cost labor and how we can't have that sort of Chinese low-cost labor in the US. People don't want those jobs. So how do we get around that and bring manufacturing more locally? So I've been working on a robot called Baxter. Uh, Baxter's a, a humanoid robot. It does look like the science fiction robots, uh, it turns out, in this case. Uh, and I'm going to show you some video of, of, of how Baxter operates. Um, here's uh, someone programming it. 
Not, and she doesn't know about quaternions, it turns out, whereas current industrial robots, you have to know about quaternions to, to program it to do anything. She just picks it up, she moves the hand, she presses some buttons, the robot figures out what she means. Now it's going to do the task. Oh, and it says, oh, I don't like that kinematics that you gave me. Uh, so it moves the other arm out of the way, it optimizes the, 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 the pathway, it figures it out, it's looking a little puzzled, so you get some feedback as this happens. Ah, okay, now I know what to do. So, the idea, and, and here you can, it's, it's a bit washed out, but there's a, a graphical user interface. It's as easy to use as a smartphone. Um, here's the robot, um, doesn't know what to do. She goes in, she shows it the objects it's supposed to see, it learns the objects. She trains, shows the left arm and the right arm different objects, tells them what to do with it. And in a matter of minutes, it's now able to sort these objects. But it's got inbuilt intelligence. So um, here, oh, it missed, damn. Um, but it's, it's OK. It figures it out. It goes and tries again. It's got error recovery built in and uh, goes off and, and, and picks up the, the uh, object with its left hand that it's supposed to pick up and goes and puts it where it's supposed to be. Um. <laughs> and everything is force-based. So it feels a force. It lets go. It, 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 and it's safe to be around. Oh, dear. If that was a current industrial robot, she would be dead, but she's not. But you program this robot by grabbing it, moving it, showing it. You don't need any external language. You don't need an external computer. You just show it what you want to do, interact with the graphical user interface. You plug it into other machines. It interacts with the other machines, and it does real tasks in real factories. By the way, it's built in the United States. It's $22,000. Um, it's a very low-cost robot built, built here. Um, and the trick we play is we make it so that the end user doesn't have to know deep stuff. So the end user, sort of like an IKEA catalog, gets to uh, build a hand for the particular task they want to do with a kit of parts. Uh, they put the pieces together. Um, they don't need training on how to build hands. It's all very graphical. They build the hand, but now the robot can see the hand itself, so it's got to know what the, its own hand looks like. So we let the robot put it up against a red screen, see through its camera what the hand looks like, and figure the stuff out. We don't ask people to do complicated things. We let the robot do the complicated stuff. Um, so these robots are now starting are shipping. They're starting to be in, in factories. This is Mildred. Mildred has worked for 25 years in a plastics factory in Connecticut. This is one hour after she first saw an industrial robot, first time in her life. In that one hour, she had learned to program it. She had made it do tasks in the factory. She's getting older, as are all our factory workers are getting older. But by giving them a tool that they can interact with and they can program, it's not like automation is coming from on high. They become the robot um, uh, supervisors. They get control of what they're doing. And I think that's very important. So that's one sort of invention we need. There's lots of other inventions. There's the uh, Formlabs 3D printer. 3D printers are great, but we need, some, we need 3D printers to be much better. They have to be able to deal with plastics and metal at the same time. They have to be high speed. 3D printers are too slow for bulk manufacturing. Um, they need to be able to put electronics in as they print things. And the killer app, I think, for 3D printers is if they could build tools. If they could build tooling so that you can have molds for plastics and metal. On top of 3D printers, you need super CAD, I call it. CAD that's parametric. CAD that involves the manufacturing uh, knowledge and information in the CAD. It's not just a WYSIWYG, this is what the part looks like, it's how the part is built. Because once you have that, now designs become much more portable than they were before. So lots of invention. But we also need infrastructure. In information technology, we've had this infrastructure that's grown over the last 30 years, which makes it easy to do a startup. Because you've got the network, you can just plug into the network, you've got the infrastructure. But we need different infrastructure for manufacturing. Um, and there's all sorts of infrastructure that we have lost in the US. Um, this is a, 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 a little company in Silicon Valley. I happen to know it because the upper person there is my daughter, Alice. Uh, she started a company to build something. She went on uh, uh, um, Kickstarter, as many people do, raised much more money than she expected, promised she would manufacture her product in the US. Now she had thousands of customers, had to manufacture, tried to manufacture in the US, couldn't do it, so she and Bettina headed off to, to China. This is all in the space of three or four months. That's where she had to go in order to scale up 
manufacturing. And one of the critical things was 3D printers were not fast enough. She needed tooling, couldn't get tooling in the US, had to build tools in China. That's a common theme. Uh, building, you have to build tools in China because there just isn't that capability in the US. So how do we help all these people with these great ideas? We need um, infrastructure. We need quick scale up. Flex, the president of Flextronics just a couple of weeks ago said he would love to have more manufacturing in the US, but in Asia he can go from zero to a fully function, functioning factory in three months. He can just put it all together. Can't do that in the US. Can't do that quick scale up. We need supply chain dynamism. You know, uh, people say we can't bring iPhone manufacturing back to the US because there's not a supply chain that can support building 50 million uh, iPhones every three months where the models change and have that dynamism in the supply chain. So we need to, there's a lot of infrastructure we need to build and infrastructure companies. And then tooling, critical, critical, critical. That robot I showed you that we built, $22,000, made in the US, has almost 200 tools. We could not build the tools in the US. We had to build the tools in China uh, and bring them back to the US. There is not that capability. But there's also um, business models. Business models have changed every two years in the information technology space for 30 years. The business models that operate today, you couldn't even conceive of 30 years ago. You, uh, many of them you couldn't conceive of 10 years ago. You know, Twitter just bought uh, Bluefin uh, Labs. Who knew that Twitter, uh, Twitter analytics was a big idea that there were going to be lots of companies competing around? So the business models change all the time. And business models in manufacturing have not changed for the last 50 years. So there's incredible opportunity there. So here's just one example of changing a business model. Um, right now, <clears throat> a product company, you design the product, you go over to China, you build it in China, then you pay high oil prices to bring it to the US. It goes out into retail through some channels, and the retailers get it out to people, um, whether they're uh, brick and mortar or, or uh, um, internet retailers. That's how things work now. With enough invention, it, maybe things will change how, how it works. Maybe the product companies sell their designs in SuperCAD to the retailers. The retailers get local manufacturers to bid on this package that they have, which includes all manufacturing information. And the manufacturers build the stuff, and it goes out to people. Again, maybe not via a brick and mortar uh, 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 store. So the, the, that's an example of a different sort of business model that can come about with the right tools. But there's lots and lots of, of, of business models that can come about. Uh, like we see in information technology, there's all sorts of business models about plug and play equipment, how that comes together very quickly. There's business models about supply chain optimization. There'll be lots and lots of, just like there's lots and lots of ad analytics companies, lots and lots of companies about supply chain optimization. And the very nature of how you buy stuff in your supply chain. Um, I liken it to GE used to sell jet engines. They now sell hours of jet engines operating. Right now, people buy stuff. Maybe they start buying flow rather than stuff. So there's all sorts of things that can happen in business models. So we've got people out there doing stuff. We've got these, these uh, uh, makers and, and various people doing things. But if we come together and think about this together, we can do lots of things and change the way manufacturing works. And so we see people, um, makers, and there's one of the makers here in the front row, Steve. Um, yeah. <laughs> you know that guy. <laughs> So Steve, in his, in his weekends, he makes stuff, and then, and then he carries that over to his, 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 his weekday job and, and, uh, and invests in companies that make bigger versions of that stuff. Um, so these makers are doing stuff. There's people building 3D printers. There's people doing things. As we come together, we can, we can make them much more efficient because you know, they build some, some radical stuff, but sometimes there's a little too much Steve Wozniak and there are not enough Steve Jobs. And we need to help this movement with a little more of that. And so I, my call to action here is all of us, let's start building stuff. And let's make the stuff. Let's make it in the US. We can do it. And we get a much more resilient manufacturing. Thank you.